Great pronunciation on gun. He'll never learn pronunciation, will he? No, he's Team Gun, not the correct Team Gun. Well, he had me until he pronounced Gun Gun. His pronouncing's hurt. Gun again, please. Gun. Gun. It's gun. 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 Mark, I love you, by the way. But when I hear Mark do it, it's more of a gun. Gun. He says gun to me. <laughs> okay, so apparently I'm saying the name wrong, but there's only one way to figure out if that's true, so one second. There she is. I am it. <laughs> I am it. Yes. You're Japanese, right? Yeah. Which means you speak Japanese, right? I think so. Okay. You know Hunter Hunter. You've seen the show. Yeah. What's the main character's name? Gong. All right. So whatever. I made a mistake. His name's Gong. And this week I'm covering some crazy material. Last week I gave you my review of the first arc of this story and in it I uncovered some subtle indications of an emotional maturity and attention to detail that gained my praise early on. But did the story in these more recent arcs let me down or did they continue the trend in an upwards direction? Find out today as I explore the two short but powerful arcs that build upon the first in crazy and surprising ways. Welcome back everyone to my blind review of one of the shonen genre's modern greats. This is Hunter Hunter's Zoltan. Baltic family and Heaven's Arena arcs. The note that we left the last arc with was one of horror, mystery, and pursuit. Having spent a considerable amount of time struggling to attain their respective hunter licenses, after having done so because of what happened with Killua, it didn't feel like a moment of celebration, but instead one of great loss and shock. Gong sought after the hunter license, but in his journey to acquire it, he made a lifelong friend group wherein each member cared tremendously for each other. And casting my mind back to the very first chapter when I saw Gong sat on his own fishing, the fact he has all of these people to fall back on must mean a great deal to him now. And when he grabbed Illumi's arm to reprimand him, there must have been, much like the small animal in chapter one, a great deal of self-projection onto Killua from Gong. He doesn't want to be left behind and so, no matter what, he can't let Killua believe he doesn't have a companion in him. Someone that truly cares, no matter the circumstances. And these are pretty dire circumstances if you think about it. Take a character like Luffy, Goku, or even any of the Jojos really, and plop them into this setting with this information? While I'm sure they would be able to see the nuance of the situation and eventually understand that Killua was traumatized by his family, they would in some shape or form care that he killed someone. But Gong never even mentions it. While the person Killua ultimately killed wasn't a noteworthy character by any stretch of the imagination, one of the few lines he did have painted him as a man with a noble disposition, stating that he specifically wouldn't hurt or fight a child out of principle and in the end it was a child that killed him, stabbed in the back. But no matter what, what, Gong is determined to be there for Killua, which is exactly where we find ourselves heading on this adventure. I mentioned last week that Gong and Killua are almost two sides of the same coin, each experiencing similar problems but on different sides of the spectrum. Through Gong's conversation and actions across the first arc, it's been made explicitly clear that he doesn't see value in himself due to a deep sense of inadequacy brought on potentially by abandonment issues. And Killua feels an overbearing sense of assuredness due to his family's relentless desire to be in his life. Both Gong and Killua feel like they are on a shared journey exploring different aspects of the family theme on different sides of the spectrum. In other words, they're sort of opposites, demonstrating perhaps what sort of toll toxic or neglectful family dynamics can have on a child. And if you believe it, this is sort of communicated visually too. Just by looking at these characters you can tell that they are similar but also kind of the opposite. However, you would only be able to recognize this fully in the manga. In it, Gong and Killua are both the same age, gender and height, but while Gong has tall, black, spiky hair, Killua's hair is styled down and is white. Furthermore, during this section of the story, in the battle arena, which specifically focuses on their relationship and adventure together, Killua is further in contrast with Gong by wearing a black top while Gong isn't filled in, and therefore appears white. So in addition to Tagashi's choices serving to differentiate the characters for easy reading, they subtly communicate this aspect also through the visuals. And little did I know, as Gong, Kurapika, and Leorio now make their way to Killua's family home, a world of hurt 
was once again waiting for the young boy with the spiky hair. Zoldic Family Arc. This arc is remarkably short, and with it only being five chapters long, I wasn't exactly expecting much from it, and in a way I was kinda correct, but that's not to say interesting stuff doesn't happen within this yet unknown material. Within its chapter 39 opening, what first caught my eye was an elegant dialogue exchange between our heroic trio, reminding me exactly why I love Tagashi's writing. As they approach Killua's intimidating mountain home looming over the horizon, this panel captures each respective character perfectly as they react to the sight of said mountain. Kurapika, looking ahead, wants to make a plan. Leorio, looking for security, wants to locate a place to stay first. And Gon just wants to see his friend. You could remove the character artwork in this panel and still know quite easily who's talking. Stuff like this isn't flashy or praised very often, but in my opinion, these are fundamentals that do most of the heavy lifting when it comes to character writing. Everything they say is informed by who they are and not by what makes the plot more interesting, which by default makes each of these characters that much more interesting. I mean, as they approach the foot of the mountain after coming to a halt when faced by the walls surrounding it, we're told the rules on how to get through and the consequences of jumping over. Normally, this would result in a rebellious streak or excitement building in the main character, who might want to test his new abilities against these obstacles up ahead. Lord knows that formula works for other series, but not gone. That's not who he is. In fact, he has no interest in being tested whatsoever. He's there to see his friend, and if that makes him an intruder, then so be it. It's incredibly strong character writing that once again tears down the facade of this shonen world with reality and genuine reason, which are honestly what I've come to recognize as Hunter Hunter's greatest strengths. And again, similarly to the sea captain that pointed him in the right direction early in the first arc, this jaded perimeter guard in a similar fashion is impressed by Gong and decides to allow him to try and make contact with the family using his phone. Notice how everything is being informed by the character. It's like, in order to highlight the qualities of Gong's personality, Togashi places him in standard shonen situations and lets the contrast do all the talking. Pfft. You guys were expecting a fight here? Well, how about a reasonable argument and a phone call? And oddly enough, this sort of resolution makes me that much more invested because I now understand that I am watching a character and not a plot device. However, after hearing a not so nice response from one of the butlers, Gon is forced to reconsider his next course of action. If he barges his way in, he risks the lives of his friends and places the security guard in a position where he might meet harm also. And when faced by those facts, he decides the only course of action is to play ball and compete in these challenges. The first being able to push open the giant stone own doors. If they can do that, then they earn the right to advance onward without putting anyone in unnecessary danger. Obviously, they get through it in the end, but what I found interesting during this section wasn't necessarily the overcoming of the challenges, but instead the rapid healing process that Gon undergoes. Remember, this is a kid that had his arm broken by Hanzo at the end of the last arc. How did he heal it so fast? There's definitely something to this as this won't be the only time this healing ability is admonished by Gon in this video. And it's just as well for him that he healed up all nice and everything because now they are proceeding to the... <laughs> Next challenge. This scene is honestly pretty hard to watch. The only thing Gon wants to do is to meet his friend Killua, who he fears is being manipulated and hurt right now. He refuses to yield to anything that says that he can do what he believes to be a simple request, and in pursuit of this end, he ends up being beaten alive by this apprentice girl by the name of Canary. I will say, however, that after being shown the 1999 and 2011 anime adaptations of this scene, the 2011 versions sort of let the side down in this instance, in my opinion. The purpose behind this scene is to demonstrate the unyielding force of Gon versus the trained, immovable object in Canary. And to minimize the degree of suffering Gon absorbs to see his friend diminishes the impact this scene is designed in both the 1999 anime and the original manga to have. Furthermore, on the censorship front, the scene is meant to show a level of abuse and conflict in Canary's mind as she struggles to continue under the weight of her own conscience. This scene looks great in the manga and great once again in the 1999 version, but in 2011's anime, because they don't really want to show blood or that much gore, it looks comparatively lesser, I think. 
particularly compared to how impactful this sudden attack on Canary hits in the other versions of the story. Something that I obviously like about Gon is how emotionally aware he is of other people and the consequences his actions might bring onto those individuals. For the same reason he didn't press the issue with the security guard, he doesn't cause further harm to come to the apprentice. And yet, he doesn't seem to have any regard for his own well-being or safety in this scene also, which perfectly reflects his negative sense of self-worth illuminated in the prior arc during the conversation with Kurapika. But all of that aside, this mini arc sort of felt strange and off balance, and I mean that in the best way possible. I was very much excited to see a standoff of some description on this compound for Killua, but instead his dad just lets him go in an encouraging way. Now obviously he has ulterior motives at play here, but yeah, Killua gets to go free. Now, there's one more scene that follows this before they ultimately leave, and it's this coin trick performed by the butlers. Gon is surprisingly great at it, and looking back at the scene now, I think this was clearly a test to see just how proficient these kids were in a particular technique. Something called Nen gets brought up later, but now I'll just say I think that played a role here, and overall, it was a cute and fun scene that killed some time before Killua showed up, and that's pretty much the first of these two arcs. Overall, I liked it and found it entertaining. I thought the character writing was on point and brilliant, and the pacing again was snappy. Hunter x Hunter, in this case, continues to be a surprisingly easy manga to digest, and I hope it continues in that direction as we dive into Heaven's Arena Arc. Of the two arcs I'll be exploring today, the Heaven's Arena portion is clearly explored in greater detail. It's an arc with a beginning and an end, and interestingly, the first move of this arc is to remove half of the cast. Kurapika and Leorio, as mentioned in the earlier arcs, have goals and aspirations of their own, and so this entire arc is centrally focused around Gon and Killua. But this isn't goodbye forever, instead it's a see you later of sorts, later being specifically September 1st in York New City. Gon wants to eventually rematch Hisoka to give him back the ID he took, and so in the meantime, Gon and Killua are faced with a dilemma, how to train and get money for food and shelter. And as it happens to be the case, Killua is familiar with something called Heaven's Arena. Once again, this section is predicated on a simple challenge type concept. The goal is to get to the top of the Heavens Arena. With each passing floor, the higher one goes, the more difficult the competition gets. And in addition to that, the higher they get, the more money they ultimately stand to win. In theory, they have six months to train and prepare for York New City, and this is where they'll do it. And once again, the choice that they make to spend their time here and participate in the Tower Challenge over the coming months stems from Killua and Gon, respectively. Through small dialogue exchanges, we learn that Killua was left here as a six year old child and tasked with reaching the 200th floor before he could return home. With that small piece of information, we get a brief glimpse into Killua's past, as well as a short-term goal for us as an audience to shoot for, as everything from the 200th floor and above will be entirely new to Killua, and by extension, us the audience. So, in a nutshell, this arc is pretty much chronicling Gon and Killua's time and journey in climbing the levels of this building through intense physical competition. And it is great! Now, naturally, the introductory bouts help both the officials of the battle arena and us as an audience to get a feel for how powerful our two protagonists are when pitted against the other contestants of the Heavens Arena. And in these opening matches, Togashi makes use of a rudimentary but ultimately effective visual trick. Pitting a small character against a confident, bigger bully type character, it's very reminiscent of old school Dragon Ball with Goku in the various tournaments he participated in as a child. And the satisfaction of these scenes comes specifically from these cocky brutes getting a taste of their own medicine courtesy of a smaller, modest child. It's also funny watching Gon and Killua get immediately advised to go to the 50th level already after only one bout. Now, Killua was technically advised to go higher, but I like how he decided to stick around with his friend throughout. It's around this time also in the story we meet a competent but young martial artist called Zushi. I love Zushi. I love Japan, period. And after he demonstrates a technique that scared Killua half to death, our two protagonists end up meeting with his master called Wing. Now, <laughs> before I move on, I feel like I need to apologize in advance. As someone that grew up as a teen in the late 2000s and early 2010s, South Park was about as popular as it ever had been. And in a particular episode, there was this old Chinese woman that gets beaten unconscious in a boxing match while singing a lovely song. Now, this poor woman 
is also called Wing. And so, whenever I heard this guy's name uttered in the story, I couldn't help but automatically think of Wing from South Park getting brutalized in the face. There's no greater point I'm trying to make here other than to help you all realize and understand what was going through my mind whenever this person's name was uttered, so let's move on. Thanks to Zushi and Wing, I became aware of a particular mechanic in this world called Nen. It's this universe's magic system, and I love it. Not just because of its inherent awesomeness, which I want to talk about in a second, but also because it provides greater explanations as to what happened in the forest with Hisoka and Gon, the fight between Illumi and Killua in the previous arc, and even earlier in this video when Killua's mother made herself known and launched an attack. It helps to explain all of this quite well, and somewhat interestingly, this gave me pause for thought. Obviously, Killua has been here before, and the entire arc is predicated on that fact. But when he was here last, he was working under orders from his father to reach the 200th floor and then come home. Now that we've been familiarized with this arc, we understand that Nen is a key component to all of the fights, pretty much, from the 200th floor and above. And we know that Illumi utilized that power too. So I ask, why has Killua not only never used Nen, but also never seen it or heard of it prior to this very meeting with Wing? It seems like something his father or family would have taught or exposed to him at some point given their knowledge of it. And this lack of knowledge leads the two boys to, once they qualify for the 200th floor, to run into some trouble. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, this lovely and not at all suspiciously flirtatious or creepy toward children killer clown man, little kid lover, is sitting there putting up a force field of sorts in front of the two kids. And this is somewhat disconcerting because they need to register before midnight for the 200th floor, otherwise they lose their placing. And so they seek out Wing once again to help them master one of the four fundamentals of Nen to make their way past him to register. After which, Gon finally gets a taste of what the 200th floor's competition looks like. They all use Nen, and even though Gon demonstrates great promise in his opening bout, managing to even... I mean, yeah, he uses Ultra Instinct and dodges the dude's Beyblades for hours. Eventually, he does fall though, so time to get back to the drawing board. And on this drawing board, I think it's time for me to finally talk about Nen because it's honestly one of the more complicated and brilliant power systems I've come across. Power systems in anime offer a lot of upsides. The scale of the battles gets larger, making them more cinematic, and it helps to individualize a particular series in a sea of other popular, more derivative works. What's One Piece without Devil Fruits? What's Dragon Ball without key manipulation? Could you imagine the Dragon Ball series without the Kamehameha or the Super Saiyan transformations? Probably not, because that system is a fundamental part of our enjoyment with the series largely. However, with those upsides potentially come negatives and drawbacks. Dragon Ball's power system famously runs into issues with power creep as our main characters go from training on a beach with an old man to literally training with the gods themselves. And that's all down to the structure of the system we're talking about right now. It most definitely has its benefits, but it's important to also acknowledge its shortcomings. Nen, however, seems to have an appreciably different approach than many other power systems I've seen. In fact, I don't think I've come across any that match it perfectly. Whether that's a good or a bad thing is still up in the air, but time will most definitely tell. From an aesthetics or visual standpoint, it's sort of like Jojo's stands meets Dragon Ball's key. If you don't use Nen, you can't see Nen, much like stands in Jojo, and the auras, particularly in the manga, look distinctly Dragon Ball. However, mechanically, they are very different. And this, to be honest, I'm really excited to see explored further. This Nen power system is sort of like a more complicated iteration on what I recognize as Avatar The Last Airbender's bending system for the Avatar state, and maybe even One Piece's Devil Fruit system to some degree. Though, obviously, Hunter x Hunter came before Avatar. Similarly to Avatar, each person seems to fall under a neat category, but unlike Avatar, anyone can learn the other types available to them. Uh, sort of. Nen seems to also work on a chart system, wherein the closer one's natural Nen type is to another type, the easier it will be to master and implement alongside his current original one, particularly compared to the ones farther away on the chart. In Avatar, Aang seemed to have similar issues. Being an airbender, he was able to master water and fire much easier than his natural opposite in earthbending, which required significant
significantly more work. Nen, from my understanding, for the most part shares in that same principle. The chart looks like this and includes Nen types like Enhancer, Transmuter, Conjure, etc. They each offer different approaches to Nen and that's honestly great getting plenty of variety. Speaking as someone that's only just met this power system, mechanically I think it's super interesting and I can't fault it right now. In many respects, I think it's better than Avatar's system because it frees up this mechanic to work as the checks and balance system by which every Nen user must operate, not just one individual. But with that said, unlike Avatar, Pokemon, One Piece or even Dragon Ball which all have easily understood and intuitive power systems, Nen has a larger learning curve. While it makes sense and can be understood, I don't think the personality traits associated with each various type can be understood as easily as water is the opposite of fire in Avatar or Pokemon. In Hunter x Hunter, these traits are things one must learn through exposure to the property and in reading the latter material of this arc, I found myself having to refer back to the Nen chart numerous times in order to make sense of or to figure out where one Nen user was in relation to another. Because to me, it's not obvious that the opposite of transmuter is manipulator. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is an absolute negative as it may very well lead me to being more easily surprised later on down the line as characters experiment with Nen further and further outside of their comfort zones, but I will say that there's a reason why Dragon Ball's key, Avatar's bending, and One Piece's devil fruits are so ubiquitous and part of pop culture today, and why I have never heard of Nen prior to the making of these videos. And honestly, I think that's a shame because I sincerely think this system has so much more to offer than I can fully appreciate at this moment in time. Which is made super obvious given the fights that unfold after Gon and Killua proceed with their training under Wings wing? Now, that's not to say that the story doesn't go to considerable lengths to help communicate the basic concept of Nen to us, apart from Wing schooling us in the four basic tenets of Ten, Hatsu, Ren, and Zetsu, we're also shown how most of each of these play into various fights. Zushi's initial fight with Killua on the 50th floor demonstrated Ren, Gido's first fight with Gon demonstrates an application of Nen in various forms, and Gon's second fight with him after Gon's training demonstrated the hole in Gido's strategy while also informing us that an emotional attachment to an object strengthens the Nen of that object, it became very interesting because I just know there's a sad story behind that fishing rod now and... Okay, hold it together, Mark. Primarily, this second fight served to highlight a hole in Guido's strategy, with this very flaw being brilliantly highlighted perhaps more clearly in this subsequent fight. Castro is demonstrated early on to be a powerful Nen user, but in the end failed to defeat Hisoka because he required a lot of energy to pull off this ambitious and effective, but ultimately ill-matched technique to his Nen type. Because Castro's Nen type wasn't naturally effective in learning this skill, the level of focus and energy required to pull it off became Castro's downfall. All the while, Hisoka manages to make himself look even more intimidating and terrifying, unfazed by his arm's dismemberment. I loved this fight in the manga, and unfortunately, I learned that in the 1999 anime adaptation, it pretty much cuts it all out, with only a few short highlights of it left included. Now, this may or may not have played a role in this, but I did notice during my reading that a viewer survey was conducted during this section, and Killua was seen as the clear fan favorite, with Gon being in third place. I find this interesting because instead of keeping the entire Hisoka and Castro fight like the manga and the 2011 anime did, the 1999 anime adaptation decided to add a filler fight with Killua instead. Now, I have no idea if this was censorship or a one to include Killua or something else entirely. I just wish they didn't cut it. With that said though, I do want to draw attention to a piece of filler in the 1999 anime that I absolutely adored. While going up and down the various levels of the Heavens Arena, both Gon and Killua encounter this woman operating the elevator. <laughs> She's a very minor character in the manga, but in the anime, she's the vehicle for some terrific comedic moments, with her last encounter with the boys being particularly hilarious. <laughs> With that aside, I think possibly the coolest reveal from this arc for me was one of these two things. Hisoka's spider tattoo being revealed after his fight with Castro being the first, the fact that this man now is tied not only to Gon, but also Kurapika definitely piqued my interest. But the most fun revelation of this arc has to be that the Nen training was all part of their hunter training. In other words, the hunter exams were still sort of ongoing. It's really cool to hear how others are getting on and it makes a lot of sense in universe considering the sorts of people we've come to familiarize ourselves with in this section, but even with that said, if I was living in this world, I don't think I could trust anyone after someone told me this. But all of that aside, we finally find ourselves at the climax of this arc. Hisoka versus Gon. <laughs> <laughs> 
For the record, these characters' respective journeys in this series thus far have been somewhat intertwined. Gun seems to be both scared and motivated by Hisoka's looming presence, and Hisoka is interested in Gun. And with visuals like these, I'm not sure what that means, nor do I think I want to know. But anyways, this fight spans three entire chapters and for the most part is all action. The drawings in these chapters are fantastic and the action flows incredibly well. Ease of deciphering and reading through a particular page is what I look for the most and these chapters concerning this fight absolutely deliver on that premise. Additionally, for my benefit, I was shown both the 1999 and the 2011 version of this fight too. Funnily enough, one thing that was pointed out to me was how weird the sound effects towards the start of the 1999's version of the fight were. I mean, check it out. <laughs> Additionally, on this front, one of the driving narrative talking points after this fight concludes is that of the referees judging. In the manga, it feels like maybe Gon gets something of a raw deal, but it's well within the realms of plausibility. But this is very different in the anime, because the anime needs to fill in the action segments to give the fight the appropriate pacing. And because of this, the flurry of strikes and attacks Gon ends up landing on Hisoka seem unmistakably dominant. I mean, there's one part of this fight where Gon lands dozens of hits and he barely gets any points for them. And so in the manga, it's possible the ref is acting in good faith, but in the anime, it sort of feels as though the ref has something out for this little kid. With that said, however, the 1999 version of the fight has some incredible animation, with its storyboarding in certain sections impressing me the most. Whether it be the insane angles attempted or the water droplets flying through the air, these choices to convey this fight only serve to elevate it within its medium. With the commentator in the 1999 version clearly loving what she does, shown through some terrific character acting animation. Overall, I love this fight sequence. It's my favorite fight of the series so far and I'm very excited to see how things proceed from here. With our two heroes, Killua and Gon, now having completed their training, Gon the Enhancer and Killua the Transmuter, I am very excited to see how their powers develop and how their roles within the story change and grow. Overall, I thoroughly love these two short arcs of the story. I found the Zoldic family arc to be the most emotionally rich while I found Heaven's Arena to offer the most fun and entertainment. Not to mention lore concerning Nen. All of these story arcs seem to consistently admonish a strong sense of progression and fun and now that we have York New City on the horizon all the while both Gon and Killua are heading back to where the series began I'm very excited to see what more comes from this amazing story next week will be my first video covering York New City and I can only hope that I am ready for what's to come within that material thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see you all in York New City next week <laughs>